Hi, Mitch Wenger back with another video on data analytics and machine learning. In this video, we'll discuss what makes a good model. Hope you enjoy. Okay, let's get started. Before we can start digging into the models to determine which ones are good and which ones are bad, we need to step back and think about the goal of our investigation. What is desired from our data mining results? What is it we hope to accomplish? Do we want to improve sales? Decrease costs? Achieve better outcomes? How can we measure that a model is any good? I.e., how can we measure model performance in a meaningful way? It's not quite as easy as you may think, but it's not terribly difficult either. Now, model evaluation is application specific. Nevertheless, we can look at some common issues and themes in how to go about evaluating a model. So we want to consider what kinds of frameworks and metrics are available for classification models. How can we use them to our advantage? And we'll get a start on that in this video. Now, classification terminology can be a bit counterintuitive. In many situations, we have a binomial class where we label the bad outcome positive, as in sound the alarm, and the good outcome negative, as in nothing to look at here. Some simple examples you're probably already familiar with. When you take a medical test, well, if that test comes back positive, that's not good. It means that a disease is present or some symptom is there or some indicator is there that we're looking for but hope we don't find. Same thing with fraud detection. A positive test means, well, we have unusual activity on that account. We'd better check into this. In many situations, as a matter of fact, in a lot of data mining situations, we're only interested in a small percentage and sometimes a very, very small percentage of cases. A classifier should try to distinguish the large majority of routine cases, those that are negative, uninteresting, from the very small number of alarming cases, positives, interesting, those that we want to investigate further. In thinking about our model, we want to consider how we think about mistakes. In particular, we need to be cognizant of the type of mistake. In our two-case example, the number of mistakes made on negative examples, false positives, we call those, can be relatively high. On the other hand, we need to consider the relative cost of each mistake as well. In most scenarios, the cost of each mistake made on a positive example, false negative, will be relatively high. Up to now, we've just measured a model's performance with a simple metric, classifier error rate, accuracy, R squared, something like that. So this general formula of accuracy tells us, well, accuracy is the number of correct decisions we made over the total number of decisions we made. Basically, we're looking at one minus the error rate. Now, classification accuracy is popular, but it's just too simplistic for applications of data mining to real business problems. Why is that? Well, as we've alluded to already, the type of mistakes a model makes is a huge consideration in how you view it. Which correct or incorrect decisions are most critical? In order to gain insight into the performance of your model, you need to drill down a bit deeper. To do this, we can decompose the problem and count the different types of correct and incorrect decisions made by a classifier. A confusion matrix is an efficient mechanism for decomposing the accuracy of various decisions in a problem involving N classes. So we create a matrix that's N by N, where we plot the actual classes against the predicted classes. As you might remember from running examples through your tool of choice, each example in a test set ends up with an actual class label, but it also gets labeled with the class that was predicted by that classifier. 
And you can see how this works when you evaluate the prediction results of a model that you've built in, say, Rapid Miner or Alteryx or Azure Machine Learning Studio. So the confusion matrix separates out the decisions made by the classifier. The actual true classes, positive or negative, are across the top as column headers, as you see here. Predicted classes, yes or no, as row headers. So the main diagonal contains our count of correct decisions, true positives and true negatives here. Now it's perfectly fine to rotate the layout of your confusion matrix so you can do your predicted as your column headers and your actuals as your row headers. In fact, different tools provide different orientations. Either way, the information is the same, but be sure to check the layout of any confusion matrix you encounter to make sure you understand how the predicted and actual label values are laid out. It's important to understand confusion matrices as they are an important component of evaluating classification models. We'll come back to confusion matrices from time to time going forward. What about our typical scenarios where the positive case of interest is quite rare? We call this unbalanced classes, and it raises a number of issues regarding how to build your model. Another consideration is this. If we don't use accuracy to evaluate our model, what other framework can we use? As it turns out, we can use an analytical framework we're already familiar with, expected value. The decomposition of accuracy into the confusion matrix is a good step toward that. From there, we can evaluate our use of classifiers in model building, then frame our evaluation of those classifiers based on our expectations for the full population. We'll get into that in more detail in upcoming videos. As always, we should keep baseline performance in the back of our minds as we move forward with our analysis. That's it for this introduction on understanding good models. I hope you found it useful. As always, be sure to check out the other videos in this series.